Hey everyone, um, this is Marcus here again, and I'm here with uh, two of my friends, uh, Caleb, who you've seen many times before, and Andrew Humphreys, who um, just recently graduated from um, George Mason University about a, about a year or two ago, and, um, and is currently at uh, Arizona State University. And so what we're gonna be doing over the next few weeks is we're going to be reading a, um, a classic book uh, by Harold Berman called uh, Law and Revolution. And it's all about the um, the papal revolution, uh, so an event that sort of happened in the 11th century that was very uh, influential on the West uh, and and the it, the development of uh, its legal tradition, the sort of legal environment. And so uh, Caleb and I are interested in this question because we're interested particularly in the church structures. Um, Caleb is very interested in the differences between the Eastern and Western sort of uh, ecclesiology and different institutions, how they played out. And I'm really interested in uh, monasticism and its institutional and spiritual function. And Andrew is, um, he did um, a lot of stuff with us with uh, Dr. Dan Klein. And so he's also very interested in the development of um, Western jurisprudence and sort of how uh, these deep roots, uh, both religious and intellectual and institutional and economic, all uh, ended up in the big thing we know of as uh, classical liberalism. And uh, so that's why we're all interested in it. So we're coming together to talk about it. And uh, Andrew's gonna do some sort of discussion leading for us. So Andrew, why don't you take it away? Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to stick more or less chronologically and spend time talking about the preface and introduction first, and then the, the first and second chapters next. And you can help me keep track of time, you know, when you think it's like, we're about 45 minutes in or something like that. You can say, let's let's switch to the second part. I'm also conscientious that if there's anyone else watching and they have or haven't read the book, we should try to get out uh, some of what we know factually about what's happening in the book uh, so people can follow. So I've got, there's there's a little bit of that. And then, and then I have a question I'd like us to explore from the introduction and the preface. Mm -hmm. But we might start by just saying, what the overarching story of the book is. And he, he discusses that in one paragraph at the beginning of the, of the introduction. Um, so that's on page one. He says, this book tells the following story. That once there was a civilization called Western, that it developed distinctive legal institutions, values and concepts. That these Western legal institutions, values and concepts were consciously transmitted from generation to generation over centuries, and thus came, came to constitute a tradition. That the Western legal tradition was born of a revolution, and that thereafter, during the course of many centuries, it has been periodically interrupted and transformed by revolutions. And that in the 20th century, the Western legal tradition is in a revolutionary crisis, greater than any other in its history, one that some believe has brought it virtually to an end. So <clears throat> the introduction does a really great job. It's, it's uh, in kind of breaking down the meaning of this title here, Law and Revolution, the Formation of the Western Legal Tradition. So the, the introduction really talks about what this idea of law is, what is meant by Western, what's meant by legal, tradition and revolution and the idea of crisis uh, and mo more or less kind of in that order. Um, so I'm, it might behoove us to just briefly say what those terms mean from the introduction so people can be following what does it mean when by Western legal tradition. And in so doing, I would like to move towards and discuss um, the question of what is the nature of the crisis according to Berman. That's the central question that I, I think we should bring out um, and, and, and understand. What does the crisis have to do with the nature of law and how we conceive of law? And, and what's Berman's alternative, if we can figure that out? So what's the Western legal tradition? Uh, what do those words mean? And what's the crisis in that, of that tradition? How does it have, what does it have to do with our conception of law and what's Berman's alternative? And if we could kind of roughly do things in that order, I think others will be able to follow and we'll, we'll have a, um, a common understanding to discuss with each other. So starting with the term law, I guess, would be the first in that order. Yeah, we could, we could quickly dispose of Western. We can go to Western then legal and tradition. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, what's Western about West? What does he mean by that? 
Um, now there's a YouTuber. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Contra Points, who's more or less on the left, but I, I liked a lot of her uh, content that she puts out. And she had a video on the West and how a lot of people on the right try to defend something like Western values, Western tradition, the West. But um, even though there, there's something to that, it is, it isn't, it, sometimes people do mean totally different things. Sometimes people mean, oh, you know, reason, post enlightenment, that's the West. Sometimes people mean Christianity. Sometimes they mean specifically Roman Catholicism. Sometimes they mean everything since Plato, you know? So, um, and, and I think the way that Berman uses it, it obviously has a very heavy emphasis on Christianity since that's a big topic of the book, but it's a little bit more than that. It's Christianity as it developed in Europe, right? So I think that, the, and, he, there, are some, there are some reference back to the pre-Christian philosophers, but for the most part, it really seems to mean here Christianity and Christian civilizations as they developed in Europe. And this relates very much to Caleb's interest in the split between East and West, because he's, uh, Berman says on page two, uh, kind of mapping onto what you're saying, Marcus, that the West has actually, West versus East dichotomies have, have different characterizations. But he says that um, he means specifically, he says right in the middle of page two, West in the phrase Western legal tradition refers to the peoples whose legal tradition stems from the events of the Gregorian Reformation and the investiture struggle, uh, which we're going to talk about what that means, this, this papal revolution, the origin of the Western legal tradition, the papal revolution. Um, and and that follows on from the split between the, the Eastern and Western church, right? So he's, when he says Western, he doesn't just mean um, arising from Greece, Rome, and Christianity, but he has a, a more narrow notion. So is that circular? He's saying the Western legal tradition is defined by this revolution that I say is the origin of the Western legal tradition, or is it, is, you know, you see my question, is that circular or is that uh, sensible? Am I making sense? Um, yeah, yeah. I think it's, um, I mean, I think he's kind of, the, at least in this point, he's setting up the definition and the rest of the book is supposed to be the proof, right? Mm -hmm. Or the proof of what he's saying. Um, but um, it seems like maybe bleeding into the the um, the next definition, the definition of law, that what I, one terminology that he introduced that I thought really interesting was the uh, legal system versus a legal order. And I think that he's basic, he's arguing something like, well, even all of the things that he ends up saying are important in um, after the after the papal revolution are drawing from all these other previous sources. It's drawing from Roman law, some it's drawing from Germanic tribal folk law, it's drawing from church law. There's there are some innovations, of course, introduced or changes, but they all are referring back to these other traditions. And so it seems like um, to be more precise, he's saying that the that the papal revolution is the origin of the western legal system or the idea of a western legal system but it's drawing on a previous western legal order that maybe isn't was not entirely western or referred to philosophers and it referred to the roman empire or other parts of the christian church i'm not sure but yeah it, it is kind of yeah it he, he does set, he does set that up now that you mentioned that just saying western is this post but that's totally, that is legitimate in some ways. It's kind of, it's kind of almost tautologically say, I'm talking about the, the tradition that arises out of this revolution and I'm asserting that it exists and that it did arise out of this revolution, I guess. Um, that, that it exists and that it's important um, and, maybe isn't, isn't tautological. And then I think also you can see um, there not being a problem here if his definition of Western is seen as a, uh, a provisional one for his argument. So he's not necessarily saying that in all cases where people are using the term Western, that they should be using it to mean the areas ruled by the Roman pontiff during the high middle ages or something like that. But he's using it um, provisionally for it in this certain legal case. And that if you take his definition as given, then his argument will flow to um, support his provisional definition and that they'll be mutually reinforcing essentially. Yeah, it's important to him that there is this overarching tradition 
that's supranational that exists above any particular nation state, right? That's one of the things that he's interested in. By it. It's not only that he thinks there's something valuable about the Western legal tradition, it's that it's a Western and not a national. It's right, it's not defined by uh, a governmental, a single governmental authority that dictates the rules and punishes people for not following them, right? So there's something about the transnational nature of it. And uh, I forget where he says it. I think it's maybe at the end of the introduction or the preface where he says that the kind of the solution out of the crisis will involve, oh yeah, it's right at the end of the introduction. He says, um, there's a need to, um, He's talking about this thing he's calling the social theory of law. It has to move beyond the study of Western legal systems and the Western legal tradition to study non-Western legal systems and traditions and of the meeting of Western and non-Western law and the development of a common language, a common legal language for mankind. For in this direction lies the way out of the crisis of the Western legal tradition in the late 20th century. So it's not like he has a parochial, um, it seems to me from what, what he's saying there, that he doesn't have like a, a jingoistic uh, attitude to the tradition. He thinks it's important, valuable, fruitful. It needs to be in some way preserved and reformed and that somehow the resources for doing so exist both in understanding the tradition, but also comparing it, relating it outside of itself. So when we're talking about Western legal tradition, people are like, bang, dang, jingos, you know, we're not, I don't think we have to be jingoistic about it either, right? But I don't think he, I don't have the sense he is. So, um, so I guess what he means by law is just actually too complicated to just put down quickly. So should we jump into the broader question? And then as we're talking about it, let's bring up text that kind of illustrates what he means. Um, and just say, what is the crisis in the Western legal tradition that he's worried about. And maybe in, through answering that question, we can bring up the issues of what, what he's meaning by law, different ways of looking at law, and what the alternatives are. Uh, you know, he, he does have this quote here on page, what is it, page, oh, page one. He says, um, um, as Fried Friedrich Nietzsche once said, nothing that has a history can be defined. So he's, he's basically admitting to this problem that I'm trying to put forward. It's not going to, I'm not going to be able to tell you, well, this is law. And then this is what the Western legal tradition is. He's just starting to tell us a story. And that's the way that the book really reads. He just kicks off. This book is about law. I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is, but we're going to be talking about all these topics all at once. And that's kind of how, that's the, that's the trouble with doing applied, you know, social science or economics or whatever you call it. Um, legal analysis or legal history is when you talk, have to talk about the history, you have to talk about the thing as it's interacting with other things. So it's very, it's actually hard to, to find what the boundary is. And so it's more, it's when you study it over a long period of time, over a big area with all these different interactions that you can start to tease out the definition. So you actually have to give the examples before you can start to, to, to describe the form. You have to climb up to the form. You can't just propose it and then show it. That is interesting. And he does spend most of his time trying to uh, suggesting what he means by the Western legal tradition by saying what it's not, right? It's mostly people think law is this or this or this, and it's not, it has to be some kind of integration and, and uh, something above and integrating all of those things, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have a yeah, sense he, of the crisis? The, uh... Yeah, he, he gives us like uh, 10 points on what the, the Western legal tradition is supposed to be and, and sees the West as doing a good job of preserving um, the first four points, but then the other six he sees as, as starting to disintegrate. And um, you know, without listing all of them, all the, the problems that are breaking down, but he sees um, things like the law as having its own internal logic or it being connected to this chain of history that's leading up to it um, or the supremacy of law over um, political authorities. Um, all these things um, starting to, to break down and law um, losing this more traditional 
character and this um, this character where there are overlapping jurisdictions as something that is the sign of the breakdown, of the Western legal tradition, which is actually quite interesting um, because Dan Klein, who's been a professor of all of us, and then um, Jacob Hall have done work on dural integration. And he, Berman sees this overlapping and kind of complex network where various jurisdictions of various laws all kind of overlap and interact with each other in complex ways as being something that's sort of distinctive to the Western tradition. And he seems to see the integration or, or concentration of legal traditions as starting to fall under one political authority as being something that is the undoing of a Western tradition. Um, and so that's something that I kind of didn't expect and would have actually thought the opposite. And so um, he said, he said the, the complex and overlapping and competing jurisdictions, both inside the nation and across national boundaries, he says has been a, uh, he said something like a source of development and growth, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, on page 10, um, he says it once was a source of development and growth. And he also says it was a source of freedom for the serf, for the vassal, and for the cleric. That there, the, there was um, someone you could run to that, that was like a source of freedom, but, but also so a source of development, somehow like the internal need to, the need to, um, integrate these different bodies into some kind of system generated kind of the internal seeming contradictions that had to be reconciled this kind of dialectical process you say this you say this he, he says it's also it's related to the scholastic uh, uh, ethos of the time of, of trying to take two seeming contradictory statements and then find the the alternative that makes the rule that it kind of supersedes the alternatives and, and integrates them um, and that rule is somehow above both of the parties, right? It's like it's it's founded in in reason and conscience, some some kind of making sense out of the conflict rather than having one party dominate another party. Yeah, and so you can see from like a, a classical economics way of thinking of there being multiple legal uh, systems or traditions having competition within them to kind of weed out inefficiencies as being something that's a factor, but then there's also um, the fact that they're always in communication with one another, that there's a super legal tradition that exists over each of the bodies of legal systems that exist transnationally, um, that is guiding this, this tradition and that guides the interplay between these various systems that creates a very uniquely Western di legal dynamic, basically. And that kind of overarching thing is a system, right? Mm -hmm. He defines on page five, he says, a legal system is a structured system of arrangements, ones whose primary purpose is to provide guidance to the various departments of government, as well as to the people generally, concerning what is permitted and what is prohibited. It seems like that's that kind of idea of a system, almost like a Hayekian idea of something that has its own characteristics that moves and integrates the parts beyond what any one of the parts would choose or consciously direct. Um, otherwise, it's no longer a system. It's, some, it's more like a, a machine, you know, more like a conscious tool of, of a single consciousness or a small group of people. It's, it seems like the tension is, um, is that uh, like a system is desired or a system that orders things properly is desired, but but there, there's also a desire to not do that at the expense of the freedom of the lower elements, right? Of the elements which constitute the system. But from giving those elements freedom, conflict becomes very natural. And that's where you get the overlapping jurisdictions and fighting over land and fighting over whether this is an ecclesially controlled matter or, or the matter of the king or, or the emperor or, and back and forth. But in each one of those conflicts, like you said earlier, there's the hope that it's not it's not just a strict dominant, it's not just system versus system. It's that the conflict actually tells us something about the system solves conflicts instead of it being about the system being the the, the system that wins any given conflict. Right. right? So preserving both of them. Talk about the subsystems, maybe, and then the overarching yeah. system. 
Right? Yeah. And that, that relates to the idea of the super transnational nature of the tradition, as well as the competing jurisdictions between church and state and local within a nation as well. I was thinking of a um, metaphor yesterday or an example to help people put ourselves in that mindset. Because today, part of the point of this story is that today we don't have the same kind of legal anarchy and we do live more or less under an integrated nation state and system. But we all do have the experience of sort of being in legal anarchy when we're children. So you have your parents, what your parents tell you to do, what your teachers say you to do. Um, if you go to church, what your pastor tells you to do. And then when you're on the playground, you, you, you play games and you develop rules and you assent to new rules. And then you say, he's the team captain or, or, or something like that, or you're it. And then you have like internal tag rules. Those are like, I don't know, like um, the rules of engagement for warfare. And you, so you do sort of experience this more rigid boundaries between different legal spheres and then the negotiation between those spheres because sometimes your parent will require you to do something that your teacher prohibits you from doing or and so every once in a while you hit those cases and so but then when you when you become an adult you're more autonomous and it's more clear my relationship with the state because well when you're an adult you are actually more capable and powerful and so we've we care about managing that more but when you're a child you actually do experience this little bit of legal anarchy and i wonder if that and, is and by anarchy you mean it's moments of of uh conflict in your conscience and what the rules are that you have to you seem there seems to be different or competing alternatives for which way to go mm -hmm. and with no previously established rule for for deciding mm -hmm. and that's like a frontier where the law is not yet developed it's like the yeah. pre-existing solution is yeah. that what you're talking about yeah i mean it usually for the most part that is result for the most part it's just parents choose or something like that but cases that people bring up today like um rights to abortion for a girl under 18 or something like that that's a case that like people debate about like should that child be more under the general adult legal order or not mm -hmm. or um things like that so that children are, remain, we have this hope or the sort of the part of the enlightenment vision is, oh, we can propose all these rules and that'll be our legal system and our moral system and our every system. And we'll get, we'll get rid of that conflict between systems problem, right? Um, by, but, by subjecting everyone to, to one plan of consciousness, some yeah. one or enlightened group is just gonna say, hey, everybody, here's the rules from now on. Yeah, okay. but, but we actually have not, done that for children for the most part in in my understanding there are of course limits there's you know parental rights and then there but there's also child negligence child abuse laws where children are integrated into that overall legal system but for the most part you can if you live in the woods you can have a child and raise the child and nobody's going to immediately stop you i mean i knew some people that didn't have social security numbers and such because they were just born on the farm so it's still possible and it's still a frontier children are always the frontier it might be interesting to note that in the introduction where he talks, where he's breaking down the terms, first Western, then legal, then tradition, this discussion of legal systems falls under his discussion of tradition. Uh, and it's my, my, what I'm gathering is that people who are conscious of a tradition might look to the tradition to deal with those moments of conflict. If you, if you see it as a growing thing, you kind of look at what, what has happened, what is what's the path that we've gotten to here by you know and then what can we do with it and he bemoans the decay of awareness of the tradition on page seven he says there was a time not long ago when a good lawyer was required to know the story and development of legal institutions it's like part of the well, part of the science of law was knowing kind of how it has developed here heretofore and not having any concept of that people would automatically be inclined, I would think, to assume that if there's, a, if there's a conflict, someone has to decide which way you're gonna go. And so then it becomes a, a matter of power. It's a, it's a rejection of the system idea of, of re resolution of conflict. And it's, and it's now, well, my side wants this result and that side wants that result. And we need to get our guys in the position of making the decision. 
to enforce it on, on other people rather than trying to find what are the underlying values, concepts, procedures that everyone's committed to that in some way will generate solutions beyond any one person's will and, and, and generate some kind of uh, cooperation, resolution of conflict that somehow integrates more fundamental, through more fundamental commitments, you know, which way we're going to go. Is that making sense? Yeah, I think so. And I, I, I think she also uses a very dynamic um, use of the term tradition, maybe more so than, than people might usually think, where he's not um, seeing it as just being the cold, dead hand of the past guiding where we're going. But um, on, I think, the top of page three, he talks about how when he's defining Western, he's talking about how you have the influences from Israel and Greece and Rome. But the Western tradition shouldn't be confused with just being um, an implementation of, of these same systems just copied over into a new place. But they're changing by the nature of the fact that what the Israelites believed was usually incompatible with what the Greeks believed, which was incompatible with what the Romans believed. And something genuinely new and novel is created by taking these traditions and blending them into something that's Western. And in the same way, what is Western tradition in the 1800s is very different from what it is in the 1200s, because what you're doing in the 1800s is you're taking what we've had for these past you know, 800 years and, and forming it and applying it to new situations that the situations that your society has um, and then applying it in, in novel ways. And so there's this holding on to what the past has been, but also finding ways to change what the past is to better fit the, the current and present situations. And so, um, kind of lost my train of thought a little bit there but no I, well at least what you said made total sense to me and, okay. and it's it's showing that the to me that the the quality of the of the tradition is is like an integrative uh, an integrative process of taking potentially conflicting elements right and making something new and yeah. he's, and he's even saying people who think that the renaissance was a going back to the pre-western in the way he means it uh, don't understand actually it was actually a, a continuation of the Western with new sources of inspiration and, and, and directions being integrated, right? Mm -hmm. The, um, and then, but that, the, so the natural next question is that if the, if the legal system is about taking things that on their face or directly in the practical here and now are conflicting with each other, but if this tradition requires a belief in the possibility of the integration of those things, what is the foundation of that belief, right? Is it Christianity? Is it just any belief in God? Is it the belief in humanity, the human spirit? What is it? Is it Plato? So, and then I think that, it, and it, at least it, at least partially, at least to like save your progress since 11, 1050 or whatever, the, um, the the history and tradition really really does matter right so he says on page uh 39 it is that the law is becoming more fragmented more subjective geared more to expediency and less to morality concerned more with immediate consequences and less with consistency or continuity thus the historical soil of the western legal tradition is being washed away in the 20th century and the tradition itself is threatened with collapse so that that historical soil is very important one because of things that like you said Andrew people just don't really study history not and it's not as if 200 years ago a majority of people really were studying history on mass but that the people in charge of of the legal tradition and taking care of it had to be steeped in that kind of tradition well, and then people the, had certain postulates and beliefs that supported it yes yes Whether or not yes, they yes. Were deeply studied and considered and backed up with historical narrative is a different question and I, so you're reading at the bottom of page 39, mm -hmm. um, relating to just above, it says legal systems of all nations that are heirs to the Western legal tradition have been rooted in certain beliefs and postulates. And that these legal systems have presupposed the validity of those beliefs. So there's some kind of presupposition that's the basis. And I would like to know what that is. 
um, that's, that differentiates it from being subjective, geared toward expediency mm -hmm. uh, rather than morality, to immediate consequences rather than consistency or continuity. Um, but I actually think we should list the five or actually the six ways he thinks the Western legal tradition is in crisis. You, you brought that up a minute ago, uh, Caleb. Go ahead, Marcus. Yeah, I was just going to say one thing, but it probably leads right into what we're going to talk about next, where he says, I think that that sense that the law is becoming more fragmented, geared towards expediency and less morality. I think if you do talk to the average um, you know, centrist person today, they do think that there are integrations between these different conflicts and different ways to mediate between them. But they'll refer to something like, you know, the most happiness for the most people, right? So utilitarianism, just that sort of utilitarian maxim does propose, if you think about it mathematically, a little literal integration, like you're doing calculus, like you're integrating what, what is the highest total area under the curve that we can generate for the utility of society. So like the, the postulate that utilitarianism is a meaningful moral philosophy is one way of proposing a belief that will recommend you towards um, thinking of oh, having this legal hope in the future. But if that starts to fall apart, if that belief is more fragile than the previous beliefs that were undergirding the hope in the legal tradition, then then the whole thing is more fragile. Yeah, it's like people recognize a, a need to do that integration. And that's a yes. proposed attempt. And he, he, re he rejects utilitarianism. And I think he does, especially in the first chapter that we're gonna get to in a minute. So or later, and I hope we bring that up again. Um, and why, you know, why, why does utilitarianism not quite do what is required, even though it's an attempt to do it? Um, but he, so he says that of the 10 characteristics that characterize the Western tradition, um, these are ones that are in fact, these are ones that somehow the postulates and beliefs are, are moving the other way. Um, people know the fifth one, we're gonna make, skip the first four, because. Who needs to know those? You can read the book. Um, <laughs> okay, number five. People see law less and less as a coherent whole, as a corpus juris, and more and more as a hodgepodge, a fragmented mass of ad hoc decisions and conflicting rules. So before there was a sense that there was a body of law that somehow, at least in theory, all worked together as a system. And now we have a hodgepodge of fragmented ad hoc decisions and conflicting rules. Or at so, least, or at least that it was the legal, I don't know, the legal, well, the, the legal profession's job to negotiate and manage and make sure that the conflicts when they did arise didn't tear apart the whole system to sort of massage the system as it was living. Right. Yeah, but I think that what he was what he's saying is it, it was recognized that there had to be uh an application or an adaptation of the system to the new but that there was a faith that there was an integration mm -hmm. and that it was the, like you're saying it's the job of those who know the body to find the solution within the body in fact that relates to the sixth point that there was a belief that the growth of law um had an internal oh, this is number seven the view was that there was an internal logic of legal legal growth that like the 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 solution to the next problem came out of a logical inherent nature of the body that existed whereas now it is seen as being moved from outside um the, and mm -hmm. number six the one before is that there was a belief in the growth of law but now there's a sense that law is just ideology it's like whatever the people who are making yeah. it want it to be today rather than some kind of outgrowth. Um, number eight that relates to these is that the view that law transcends politics is being replaced or has been replaced by the idea that law is at all times basically an instrument of the state. Nine is that the source of the supremacy of law in a plurality of legal ju jurisdictions and legal systems within the same legal order um, is being swallowed up by a central program of legislation and administrative regulation. These are all kind of ways of saying the same thing in a sense, I think. And then the last one is the nation, the, the idea that the Western legal tradition transcended revolutions. It kind of was preserved through revolution. Mm. And now is the sense that 
um, that that uh, revolution can do away with and make its own law, kind of reject. Mm -hmm. right? that yeah. And so I, when reading this, wondered if we had a spiral or like a shelling um, self-fulfilling prophecy situation going on with this breakdown because it seems like some of these things by believing that they're true would be more possible that they become true and encourage a feedback where they continue going on. So if you believe that law is ideology, you're more willing to engage with it as ideology, which further increases the need to engage with it as ideology. Um, mm -hmm. The seeing it as a hodgepodge of, of just random laws that don't need to be coherent takes away the impetus to try to integrate the various sections of the law. So it seems like a lot of these things, you, you can almost see this as like a, a breakdown in faith of the system leads to the system itself falling victim to that which you fear that it falls victim to. And mm -hmm. so it's hard to see how you necessarily undo what's being done. But it, it definitely seems like the fact that the faith is breaking down in the system is leading to real consequences to the system. And he does treat it as such. I don't think he treats this as like, um, there's this theoretical breakdown of the legal system, but it still exists as it did. I think he sees it as the faith in the system is dying. And because the faith in the system is dying, the system itself is dying or falling apart. That's yeah, you very insightful. I ha, that helps me a lot. Yeah, I, I was going to say you can't take like a um, a scientist's a like laboratory perspective on this on a social science or a science about humans because you're a human yourself, right? So I think a lot of people, even maybe people that that are you know they're more conservative, they're more traditional. They say, oh well, I wish that we still had these Western values, but we'll see if we. We'll see if they go away or not. As if they're someone just outside looking at the whole society going, oh, why are they turning away from these things? Or they're, they have some sort of model or understanding of why people turned away from these things. But I don't think you can just be indifferent yourself and then see which way it goes. Your choice to remain indifferent so that you can be a more objective observer or something like that contributes to what ends up happening, right? So I think that a lot of people, they are, they simultaneously are, they're comfortable, you know, sort of expressing their desire that we, we contained or we retained some of these older traditions or we retained this legal system, but they're simultaneously not comfortable with really digging down and, and putting their foot down and being part of the, you know, resurrection or, or um, re-revolution of the, of, of the whole spirit too. People want to be too academic about it. Do you guys ever read the Co Evolution of Cooperation by Axelrod? No, but I, I've read parts of it and I've read like, you know, the, I know the experiments that it works in, or the simulations. So it's, it's uh, looking at what are, the, what are the dynamics of groups operating on different rules and how, um, and looking at kind of prisoner's dilemmas and repeated prisoner's dilemmas. And he shows that under certain circumstances, a, a small group of people cooperating in a certain way can become the dominant strategy and evolve to become successful and, and overtake. So I, I, this is making me think that if you, if you, cause it's, you know, he shows that for example, under certain assumptions about people's time preference, like how impatient they are, just 5% of the population having a, a dominantly cooperative strategy, bec they become the group that mm -hmm. becomes most successful and, 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 um, so that the, the question then becomes, if you have people just 5% conceiving of law differently, then, then you're like, but 95% of people just see it as an arm of the state of policy of the hodgepodge of command. If there's enough people are saying, you know, what, we need to integrate it. We need to see it as a body. We need to understand its tradition. Um, it just makes me wonder if that's, if that's applicable here or not. And it, mm -hmm. it means that this book is in a way a contribution to I don't think he thinks we can go back to uh, the religious beliefs that served as the foundation that started the tradition. At least we, you, on wide scale, quickly. Right, but, but I think, so on page uh, VI of the preface, 
he says um, that there's a dec decline of community and that uh, the traditional symbols of the West, they, their images and metaphors have been above all religious and legal. Um, the connection between religious metaphor and the legal metaphor has been broken. Neither expresses any longer the community's vision, like the whole, like the community having a single vision of law and religion and how they integrate. Mm -hmm. And he says, since we can't go back, since there's no way to go back, the only question is how do we go forward? So on some level, I'm seeing after what Kay was saying, that this book is it's like a contribution to saying, what is the Western legal tradition? Hey guys, it has been a corpus. It is a corpus, right? That is what it is. Can we think of it that way? Um, and not to go back to its origins, the beliefs of its origins, but some kind of understanding that it is a body, that it is above any particular government or, or national jurisdiction, um, and that it exists not just as a philosophy, not just as a history, but as a tradition that has these qualities, that it is a, a body, an integrated body that has a logic of evolution. Um, if we just start thinking of that way, then it'll change our actions and perhaps we can restore the good qualities that have enabled it to, to do its job in the past. You might even be able to think just like you're talking about the axelrod, sort of if 5% of the society operates this way, it just sort of envelops the whole society. You could even think about um, these, these, these early movements. So the early Christian church, even by the time of Constantine, I think was only about 10% of the Roman populace, which is a similar kind of thing, just a specific set of people living this way. And then when Constantine pushes one lever, it, it grows faster and faster and faster. And you can think of Constantine as one of the people that got hit by Christianity and then it and, and envelops the whole thing. And then, and then you can think of um, the men of letters in the Enlightenment as a similar group who are doing something similar, but not exactly the same to parts of Christianity. And you can think of the, uh, the Marxist revolutionaries as a similar group. The Bolsheviks are a similar group in, in Russia, right? So, yeah, and it, it, it lends a little bit of credence to, the, um, to the, um, the ideas side over the matter side of history, that these small groups that have a peculiar ideology are able to have this really strong immediate impact. And I think that's why um, there's a focus on something like revolutions, because revolutions is where you can see most clearly a new principle being applied or a new way of things being applied. That's why that's so they're so interesting to focus on, focus on this book, probably because they're easier to talk about. So if his if this was a book on the Western legal tradition and how it developed, it would be way harder to write than it's really about if we get down to it, the book is really about the papal revolution, right? For the most part. But the, there are other books that are like, oh, the hist like um, we've read um, Larry Seedentop's book before, uh, essentially doing something similar to this, but talking about um, Christianity as a whole. And um, and that has a similar spirit, but since he's only talking about, he's, well, since he's talking about all of Christianity, it's actually harder to capture what his thesis is. But um, like Tom Holland's book, Dominion, I don't know if you're familiar with that, Andrew. That's that's another, it's another one that's similar to Seed Top. Tom just Holland, is he that, is he Spider-Man? Yeah, he is also Spider-Man, okay. yeah. So he's yeah. Spider-Man and he's a popular historian in England. <laughs> but, um, and, and, but, and he uses the, I think he uses the phrase, how the Christian revolution changed the West, if that's right, Kel, that's the subtitle of the book. It's something so. like that, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that, this idea, yeah, that's the one word we haven't tackled, by the way, revolution. And I, yeah, that's the one so far. Maybe that we, haven't maybe we can do it in a future conversation, because I think we should probably move on to the, the, the historical date, you know, okay. details from this, the next couple of chapters. But I do want to just uh, bookend what the first half of our conversation a little bit by bringing us back to Nietzsche. It's interesting mm -hmm. that I do feel I have a greater intuitive sense of what he is looking for and what, he, what he's meaning by that, the tradition, part of the Western legal tradition, although I can't quite tell you what it is, but it's, it's not legal positivism. It's not the idea that the law is just a tool of some to push other people around. It's not natural law, he says, and it's not merely history. It's some kind of com combination and, and trans, you know, transcending something above those things that integrates them. Um, so the, uh, going on to the details, so that was the introduction, he gives in the first chapter, 
uh, discussion of what came before the papal revolution in, in kind of the um, 11th century, the background of the Western legal tradition in German folk law, and then the second chapter is the origin uh, of the Western legal tradition in the papal revolution. So the first chapter gives us the background. Um, it describes the German tribal law and its fusion with Christianity before the 11th century. It gives, it gives context to the religious, cosmological, and social worldviews that made law binding in societies, Western societies, before the 11th century. He makes it very clear that the Germanic peoples uh, maintained their kind of social, you know, cosmological social worldview as based on kinship groups, uh, the, the concern about spirits, kind of very animistic sense of the world, and a belief in fate and the importance of honor, and especially family honor as well as individual, right? Um, but that in somehow, in some way, the spread of Christianity began to infuse a notion of universal brotherhood and individual equality, um, especially in its in kind of a, a growing body of penitential um, law, you could say, maybe not law, but legal order. Um, but that in some way that this Christianity was accepted in a way that didn't challenge the mundane or secular world that it was uh, basically people could preserve their their secular culture and understand that this is actually the question of penitence and the universal brotherhood of man and morality that's a question of my relationship to god it somehow has to do with the world to come or the spiritual world that is in some way um, here but separate from the secular world um, so he says there was no legal system. There was no, uh, it, was, it was tribal. By that he means that their kings were actually not kings of even jurisdictions. You have like the Franks were the kings of the Franks, right? And the Ostrogoths were the kings of the people of the Ostrogoths. And you could even have different tribes in the uh, geographical area. Um, should we just do, give an overview of the second chapter too and then talk about the two of them? Yeah, that sounds fine to me. So the second chapter then talks about how um, a group called the Papal Party started propagandizing about the need for the church to be free and in some way independent. And that the uh, church and state were, were fundamentally intertwined and that the secular authorities were in some way, it talks about how kings were seen as the, um, it was not the vicar of Christ, is it, is it the term that he used? The so kings were described as the vicar of Christ and the Pope prior to the papal reformation was described as the vicar of St. Peter. Right. I think that's and then it. that gets undone. Right. So the, if people see the secular ruler as the, as the head of the church in his jurisdiction. Right. And the, and the, um, and there were, there's the problem of simony uh, where people, because of this feudal political structure, uh, church property was very important, so people would uh, buy offices or give their offices to family members or to, or to people who would give them tax revenue from that property. And they had, they had that power because the, the secular rulers of these regions, lords, kings, could appoint bishops, could appoint people in, in church offices. And so the, the main thing that this papal party is trying to do is to say, the Pope is separate, the church is separate and superior to the secular. And uh, they need to be able to appoint everyone in the church and govern the church. And it's no longer, you know, no longer governed by these uh, mundane and secular forces that are not actually spiritually qualified to do so. So um, this creates an invest, the investiture struggle, the actually literal, literal violent civil wars over who gets to appoint bishops, et cetera. And there is a solution in various compromises, uh, the Concordat of Worms and the Concordat of something else. Maybe it'll come up in a minute. I've forgotten it. But there's one of Beck, one of Beck, I think, and then yeah, London. And so the, France and England, basically copy pasting a very similar conclusion. Normandy and England, right? Okay. Um, and what that says is that the there's they actually and compromise. Look at that. Neither party act, actually wins. 
the Pope gets to give the ring and the, um, uh, what's the other thing? R ring and uh, staff. It's a staff. Staff, right? That, that, that indicates the church authority, but in the presence of the emperor or the king. And they have, they kind of have some kind of veto power over each other. And then the emperor, the king gives a, a scepter of some kind that says you have this kind of uh, mundane secular authority. And, and so they figure out, and in some, in some cases, one happens after the other and a certain period after the other, but there's this compromise. Um, and that the interesting thing is that this fight generates a separation of the church. Um, Gregory the seventh uh, asserts the superiority of the Pope over all the church and over all the secular leaders, but that by doing so, he creates a theory that we, it doesn't really go into it, but it states that the secular state gets formed out of this dialectical process that, but in order to defend themselves against the claims that the, the Pope can make all the decisions, the Pope gets to that position by saying that the church is separate and above. And so then, but then the secular rulers uh, after this in some way changes and the revolution is successful in changing people's way of thinking, the secular says, ah, we're separate. And that actually means you're not, you know, you don't have complete power and we do have some means of defense by the same theory. So um, I'm curious, my questions were actually about this utilitarian issue. So on page 55, Berman describes something that I found very fascinating. Um, People may be familiar with the system of uh, Bott and Bergeld, uh, where people were, you know, one way to resolve a, a conflict in this, this early Middle Ages was by um, blood feud, right? You, you hurt someone and the family can, you just fight each other. And that over time, a system of fines and penalties became more and more standard and seen as the way that you ought to operate with one another as a way to avoid these. Um, and he says on page 55 that in some ways, the threaty, threat of heavy financial burdens upon the wrongdoer and his kin was probably more effective deterrent of crime than the threat of cap capital punishment today, just paraphrasing there, and at least equally as effective and as modern sanctioning of imprisonment and surely less expensive for society because you don't have to pay for uh, you know, in prison and that kind of stuff. Moreover, in terms of retributive, re retributive justice, not only in, is the wrongdoer uh, made to suffer, but in addition, the victim is there by made whole, right? So some kind of fine is paying. But then he says, it worked in functional terms, but this, it wasn't a utilitarian, uh, it wasn't the concept of like utility. It wasn't thought about in terms of deterrence. It was a question of honor and a question of the value placed on honor so that the meaning to people of the system that create the, created the working of the system, even though a utilitarian would say, hey, it's working really great. It has these utilitarian qualities. The meaning behind it was different. It was based in this kind of Germanic tribal fate and honor uh, conception. So my question is, um, if there's no return to that kind of, those origins, um, what is the solution to the kind of change? Is that making sense? It's like, um, maybe another way to say is he really talked about how, one of the things he stressed in this chapter is that there was no separate legal body, right? Law was, custom was, belief. It was all integrated. Um, and that one of the things that happened with the paper revolution is that law becomes separate from culture and it becomes this, its own body in some way. Uh, and therefore, you, it's something you can be criticized. It's not something that's just assumed and, and believed by the, the fundamentals of the culture. That seems to like create the possibility of the, of the spiral that, that Caleb was talking about, right? If it's just not even questioned, as he talks about in like a uh, Confucian or other uh, order where law is not seen as separate from, from the fundamental morality. Um, this this separation you, is like the beginning. There's no, it's, it's not created by utilitarianism, but we can see its functionality. Is there a, what's, what's the, is there a way back? 
is there a way back to the integration or the belief in the the moral postulates that underlie the beginnings of these things oh, i'm not sure exactly what you mean by a separation of law from the fundamental morality it where it seems like there there's there's a there's a sense of oh well we operate this way and and the blood feud is almost just the natural like you know fruition of us acting in our interests and hitting each other over the head when you take my stuff i take your stuff right in a semi-ordered way right but um just sort of setting up very basic expectations for that but it becomes very violent but then when law is introduced or when these higher courts are introduced it it puts something above the way that we tend to act that we can assent to but um doesn't that mean a a reconstitution of I guess when we say fundamental morality, the, the principles which we uh, judge things by, is that what that means? Because then it seems like law and morality are, are just evolving together when these new laws are introduced or when there's a new way to resolve situations. My understanding is that he thinks that the Western legal tradition, one of its postulates is that it is autonomous and distinct from morality intimately connected with morality, but that it is a sphere of something that has its own status separate from morality, right? or is distinct from, not separate, but distinct from morality. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the, I'm, I'm glad you're, that we're in the conversation because it's maybe, as I was speaking, I was like, oh, what's the, what's the clarity? But you're, as you're saying this, on pages 82 and 83, maybe you can help, help me understand this and it relates to what you're saying. Um, he says that on the bottom of 83, the existence of an integrated society was a necessary prerequisite for the later creation of diverse, autonomous, and competing legal uh, systems of law. Hmm. Without the prior integration, new legal systems would have been seen as merely mechanical and bureau bureaucratic, and they would have been incapable of achieving their ultimate purpose of cohesion, reform, and equilibrium. So he's saying that this... Uh, the kind of society where people don't distinguish between custom and law was the necessary soil for a distinct law. Hmm. But that the but that it seems that the, the, the making of law as distinct from what everyone just does creates the possibility of people seeing law as distinct from, you know, as <laughs> so, so the law is something alien to them. Yeah, there's something alien to them, not based on morality, something that's done to them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And so you can that's see that's a new the, thought. Yeah. The Western legal tradition as being something that's in between these two places, where it's in between it is just what you do and it is something that's just imposed on you arbitrarily. And it's some kind of union between the two. And it's coming from this one place where they were united together in the Germanic tribes. And now we're swinging towards this other side where it's arbitrary and imposed by the state but there's this in-between point for a thousand years where it was bridging this gap and so how do we correct back into this central place where it's both not just the custom of the entire population and it's also not just something some rule arbitrarily imposed by the state but it's this dynamic tradition that is related to things like morality and custom, but it's also distinct from it, but integrated with the actions and the beliefs of the people. Knocking it out of the park, two home runs. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's articulating what I'm understanding now and it's helping me, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, okay, so to get a, a little bit more concrete, I had one question about, um, so when when they talk about the pre one thing that he doesn't talk about curiously is the spread of christianity into europe in the first place he just doesn't really talk about that too much he kind of starts 800s 900s when most of continental and by that point most of um england is is colon or uh, christianized mostly for the most part scandinavia is the only place where paganism is, is thriving um and I guess some, maybe some Scotland, I, I'm actually not too sure, but um, the, so, but then he talks about, oh yeah. And you know, the church at that time, local bishops and such were sort of integrated. They were part of those legal systems, but um, 
when Christianity arrived there, I mean, a, a bishop, like that's a Greek word, right? So the that's coming from, that's something that's already coming from the East. So how, ex how exactly is something that's coming from the East just we consider it, oh, that was just part of the German society of the time. It, it, it clearly, something must have happened where the Episcopal structure of the church was interpreted into um, the local customs in some way. But it, so I suppose the, the way that he talks about the pre-revolution church, um, I was always going to say Reformation there. So I guess we have to be very clear that we're saying revolution and Reformation. So we know we're talking about the Papal Revolution and the Lutheran Reformation, right? Um, that, that, that the church arrived there and still was the church. It still was the same institution, but it never challenged laws in the same way, or it never just uh, tried to eradicate customs in the same way. Now it did some now, because of course there are stories like, um, of priests and such requiring, I think Clovis is famously the first Christian king of the Franks. And he was, um, he, there's a story about him willingly assenting to not having multiple wives, for example. And then of course, there's plenty of stories from um, the late Roman empire too. They, he, they, he brings up the story of Ambrose and Theodosius who Ambrose excommunicated Theodosius for massacring um, all of these Greeks in Thessalonica. And then only when the emperor did penance, did he receive him back into the church? And that was a very clear, this is the bishop's jurisdiction, that's the emperor's jurisdiction, even in the Roman Empire. But the, I, the Roman Empire is a, is also a different story. So this is, he, the story, our story begins after the fall of the Roman Empire, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. So right. I think that's also an important context that he doesn't mention explicitly so much. He says on page 63 that although, um, you would think that Christianity would bring into, would be seen as being in conflict with German culture. One of the reasons why it was accepted so much is that some that, that the idea of what was the relationship between the city of man and the city of God, the sec, you know, the secular and the spiritual, um, were not actually seen as at that point as directly in conflict. The church or the Christianity didn't have a role in working on this world. But it had a role mm -hmm. working on human conscience and souls for one's relationship to the spiritual here, but not, you know, in the legal legal order. Mm -hmm. you know, like you're not going to deal with the legal order. And secondly, for the world to come, either after you know, your mm -hmm. or when when the second second coming is. Um, but okay. so yeah, it's a Germanic Christianity. It, it, it was. It was, it was um, it was not like Germanic Christianity was not like modern Western Christianity. It was hardly concerned with the reform of social institutions. Mm -hmm. It did not stand opposite the political order, but within it. The ecclesiastical and uh, secular jurisdictions were intermingled. It was it's kind of like, um, yeah, is that, is that helping? Because this is important for the second chapter about ways in which the papal revolution changed this idea mm -hmm. of the church and the and the, and the uh, mundane law, and then of course there's the the Carolingian Empire is a is a is a little bit of a slightly earlier revolution that happens too, where oh this seems like it's going to be the new equilibrium in Europe, where the king is given a, or given this title of the emperor, or a particular king is given the title of emperor by the pope, and that sort of tradition continues down the line, and it's not totally clear. They he says things like. The, the, the emperor was seen as the head of the church in his region, which means what exactly? It means he's allowed to appoint bishops. It means he's allowed to um, arrest um, priests and such. And it means he's allowed to manage certain things about how priests interact with their society. But it's not clear that he's allowed to, like, it's not clear that he's allowed to make statements of doctrine or dogma or influence how the church teaches right? Or what the church does in their spiritual practice. So in that sense, is he, he's, he's, I think, I think that maybe the way to think about it is there, there's a German sort of custom of how they manage each other as tribes and such. And then this foreign sort of institution, the church arrives and they interp interpret the parts of it that are relevant for their customs into the German society. So that the, the fact that bishops own land and such that's interpreted into German society. And so the fact, oh, well, the bishop, we're just going to count him. Like if you think of, 
if they have data sets or something like that, right? The king has a data set of all the people that live in my kingdom and they're either noble or like, or not noble. And then when these bishops show up, they don't exactly fit into one of those categories. So they put them as noble, which means stuff for landowning and it means stuff for the management of armies and, and how I treat them, how I relate to them. But all this other stuff that they do that might just be well be like what they do in their free time, right? So it's possible that that's the sense in which um, before the revolution, there's a, um, we say that the, the, the kings or the emperors were the rulers of the church. That's certainly the case I'm, I've been reading in um, pre-conquest uh, England that the, the, the king managed the church. He opened a lot of the monasteries and such, and he managed um, bishop appointments almost entirely. Something that might help here is, is the, the story that Berman tells in the first chapter kind of shows the difference between the um, Larry Sudentop inventing the individual thesis and the Tom Holland thesis, because Larry Sudentop's thesis is all about the, the new recognition of the individual as like a, a legal entity, but as like a, a spiritually relevant, we're all equal and created in the image of God. Um, and that's what's kind of driving um, what it is to be to be Western. And, and this is flowing from Christianity. And you see this showing up in changes in the Germanic law after they become Christianized. And so there is a sense in which becoming Christian changes the outlook of the Germanic tribes on what it means to be human and how they should deal with people. But it doesn't break down this, the world into a secular and religious, uh, or seeing the secular and the religious as being diverging spheres or, or incompatible spheres. And that doesn't happen until the papal revolution happens. And um, that's something that Tom Holland pushes pretty heavily and, and talks about a lot. And I think that that's something that um, kind of explains what's unique about the Western form of Christianity as opposed to maybe Eastern Christianity and why you see liberalism of, uh, occurring in Western Christianity before Eastern Christianity is while well, they both had this, this change in outlook towards the individual, you also have this uniquely Western papal revolution that drives this distinction between the secular and religious spheres that creates this middle way of of doing law that in, gets in the, us to. In the page I was just reading it, he was saying that the pre-papal revolution West was more like what the East remained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the yeah. inception of the relationship of uh, the, you know, the church, I keep wanting to use the word secular and spiritual, but they were kind of somehow intertwined and just, and not to, they were at the same time intertwined in the, in the people and the functions and the doing, and one was informing and influencing the other, but they weren't distinct as separate entities. Does that make sense? Like, the, yeah. it's like, and, and the, what, he's, what I understand him to be saying is that the church didn't conceive of itself as reforming the mundane and secular. Uh, it was operating alongside it, but like a layer cake, which is like all, or, or all mixed together. Whereas the papal revolution made a distinct understanding of which was the, the two were different and that the church was there to improve reform and, and change the mundane. I think the East is actually a little bit more complicated just because the, so I've read some stuff about a lot of, obviously the big player politically in the East for most of history is the Byzantine empire. And the, there, but there was a strong sense that, oh, well, we're here in the Byzantine empire and we're sort of assenting to their legal structures and stuff, but there was this strong sense that the emperor, that they're very adamant about the emperor not having the rights to do certain things. So though it's true that Constantine convoked the Council of Nicaea, they make it very clear that the emperor's role is to convoke councils and it's the, um, the bishop's role to, to actually develop the conclusion of the council, which was copied from the Roman senatorial model. So the emperor can convoke a Senate, but he can't um, make the decision of that Senate. So the, the synod, like synods and councils that developed, 
they developed off of that model. So a bishop might might invoke a local synod. Um, that now now that I think about it, that's that's a major difference that developed after the schism was that the the East's last ecumenical council is in the 800s, right, Caleb? The seventh council, and but but the um, the West has had several since because yeah. that because it's the Pope invoking them, not they don't need whoever is responsible for the whole jurisdiction to invoke them. Now they've tried in the East, but they just haven't come together and actually done one. But so I don't. I think basically after the fall of the the Byzantine Empire, the Patriarch of Constantinople took on that role, if, as far as I know. But yeah, it's not actually I, clear. Yeah. yeah, and that's something that's been hard to figure out what exactly is going on because there's not been the same level of focal authority that you have when you're all under the empire and you had an emperor who could call authority. And then you get mm -hmm. that focalness restored within the West because you have the Pope as being having your universal jurisdiction, but you don't have this secular authority that's ruling over the entire jurisdiction ever in the East again to do that. And there's not mm -hmm. in the same way um, like this papal authority that you have in the West and the East. And so there's this struggle to figure out exactly how to promote these. Um, yeah. That's something that I've talked to Caleb a lot about, but I'll mention it to Andrew is one important difference between the West and East is, yeah, that the, for most of its history, the Eastern church was dealing with a single large political entity or a single like political cent centralized political apparatus. Whereas the Pope, even if you think about the location of Italy has historically been the most fragmented politically, one of the most fragmented areas in Europe, you know, that you have the Northern kingdoms, you have the German, like, so the, the, the big guy that he's dealing with most directly is the Holy Roman Emperor. And eventually he has to deal with the, the, the French Kings more directly, but the English King is never really a person that's a direct um, military threat to the Pope. So another interesting thing that he mentions once or twice in the book, but I just watched a bunch of YouTube videos about it, like historical videos um, from the Kings and Generals channel, shout out to Kings and Generals, which they just, I don't know if you've seen them, Andrew, they just do like these, um, they just do like, oh, they tell, it's like a 20 minute thing about history, but usually they focus on a particular battle and they do sort of an overhead shot map, like comparing the tactics and stuff. It's very fun. Um, but, but one thing that's happening at this time is um, I think for the first time since maybe the 600, 500s, 600s, there's a relatively unified kingdom in Italy, which is the Normans. So like, the, and you know, the same Normans that are going over into England around the same time, um, they develop like the Norman kingdom of Sicily and they, they have a direct sort of threat. They're directly sort of threatening the Pope and, and, and the holy or the Roman, or well, the, the holy Roman emperors are, are doing a similar thing. So the Pope chapter, could be particularly also that the Norman, the Southern Italian Normans are very essential in protecting the yes. revolution from being crushed by, by, uh, the Germanic kings, I guess. Yes. Yeah. And, and then the Norman kings, those Southern Norman kings are very key military players in the Crusades too, mm -hmm. which is also interesting. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, somehow the Normans became good churchmen. I don't know what, what that was about. But yeah. they also apparently like burned and pillaged in uh, Rome. And so uh, made, made, them, yeah. made themselves and the Pope very unhappy you know, or, or like and, very unpopular. Um, another quick point, just I'll just make one more quick point, is that, that another important event that's happening that happened around 800 in the East was the iconoclasm, where the emperor wanted to make a very clear political doctrine. We're not going to use images in worship anymore. And the exact roots of this movement aren't clear, but... Uh, to some ways it's associated with Islam because there was a lot of Islamic conquests of Byzantine territory at the time. And so he has a strong sense, oh, well, we must be doing something wrong. And so we need to be more like them and, and get rid of all these images of Christ in the churches. And um, they persecuted a lot of members of the church because of that. But the monastic community ended up being like the sole holdouts. And so there's this big figure, Theodore of Studios, who led these sort of marches through Constantinople with icons. And that was one of the earlier times where that, that movement didn't influence the West at all. So the Bishop of Rome goes, Hey, this is scary. Like lucky for us, we're not exactly the Byzantine had some territory in Italy, but lucky for us, we're not too influenced by this. So that's when he started. That's when there was really more of a movement to say the Pope, I should own my own land so that I'm not subject to these, you know, 
violent movements by the emperor, potentially, if he thinks that he has a right to roam, you know? So that, that is an earlier, 200 years earlier, a little bit of a, uh, you know, feeling out the wedge between West and East, even back then. And it has to do with this centralized political authority dominating the entire entirety of the church instead of one church, multiple political authorities. So maybe maybe we can, um, I mean, guess two, two things. We're talking about the sec this relationship between the secular and, and the meaning of the secular. We actually are talking about both chapters. So maybe we can say, what, how does the meaning of secular change? Why does it change? And what's its influence? And then also, what, how, how can it be that the Pope goes from being super weak, very, you know, very, very um, concerned about his or her position, his or her, his position, <laughs> my, female pope, my knowledge, um, to being to being able to assert and then execute the idea that I'm above kings, right? Uh, and to to a great degree, not perfect, not perfect winning, but what's the sequence that allows that uh, rep, pope, papal revolution? How does the pope? So we also have this fractured church where there's a spiritual community, but there's no church hierarchy, there's no church law, there's local custom, there's local collections of penitential rules, et cetera, et cetera. We go from that to having centralized church hierarchical church with the pope at the top we go from the pope being very weak and needing to have a lot of diplomatic um nuance with with other um others to having a very strong position in christendom so how does that happen what's the sequence there and and, and what does that have to do with the idea of the secular and the spiritual i don't have an entire answer but i have what might be a partial answer um and that has to do with the, the book of Revelation. And, and there's a talk of the, the millennium reign, so the, the thousand year reign of the, the church on earth before the end of the world, basically. And not everyone, but some people took this to be a literal thousand years from the either birth of Christ or the founding of the church. And so at the turn of the millennium, when you have 1000 AD or you have 1030 AD rolling around and you have um, this kind of like expectation that the world is going to end. There's a lot more spiritual turmoil and upheaval going on in the collective imagination or, or thought of the people in Europe and so, or in Christendom as a whole. And so it might be that the tensions that are brought about by this expectation of the end of the world coming about or this shift in belief about what the millennium means might provide the Pope or spiritual authorities in general with more leverage and more authority than they've previously had because of just the nature of the climate of the understanding of the spiritual reality in christian and he, he talks about the uh, pursuit of the millennium on page 20 the, the section starts on page 25 um as different different conceptions of of the apocalypse right um but it did, my understanding was he talked about it as, as um that the concept of the apocalypse before the papal revolution was so he, says, so he says, for example, on page 27, that his understanding is that people generally misunderstand St. Augustine's city of man and city of God, um, where people generally uh, think about Augustine's city of man being, um, what does he say? He associates it with Rome, right? And so let's read it. It says, before the great reform movement of the 11th century, the church, both in the East and West, had taught that the end time is not within this world. It's not within this world, the material world, but within the spiritual world, not in historical time, but in eternity, right? And eternity is not in time, right? It doesn't, doesn't unfold with the clock. This was the main point of St. Augustine's contrast between the earthly city and the city of God. The earthly city is in perpetual decay. That's it. Yeah. Look at it. Matter is just getting worse, and that's how it's going to be. Fall of Rome, things are just going to get horrible. Those who lived in the end time are no longer of this world. 
for Augustine, the same word seculum meant the um, seculum meant the world and time. The seculum from which we get secular right, was without hope of redemption. It would only be abandoned for it could only be abandoned for the realm of the spirit. Saint, Saint Augustine and the church generally in the first 10 centuries were against revolutionary millenarian movements of the kind described by Cohen above, um, which tried to transform the social and political economic realities of the here and now. The rebirth of the individual Christian believer was, uh, as well as the regeneration of mankind were understood to refer to the eternal soul, which experienced such rebirth and regeneration only by quote unquote, dying to this world. Yeah, so there, there definitely is this contrast that's made between eternity and then temporal time and seeing the millennium as being outside of that. But I also know that there were large or somewhat popular um, movements within Europe at the time of the millennium that saw it as being firmly embedded within time. And so there was a lot of expectation about calamity to happen at the end time. So even if um, the popular view or the, the church's official view was that um, of Augustine's that did not see the millennium as being embedded within time, there were at least enough people who saw it that way that the idea of the end times was something that was being talked about more and was more present, more forward in the dialogue at that time. That might have been something that brought people's attention more focused squarely on things spiritual than temporal, that, go that gave the papacy more leverage in its negotiation with... I understand it to be the opposite, that the spiritual okay. no, no longer is contrasted with the world and time but that the spiritual is of, of practical relevance to the world and time, right? It's, it turns people who are interested in the spiritual in some respect towards the world. I think um, yeah. on, I don't know, have you, um, I have not read The City of God, have you, Andrew? Or it's a big book, right? <laughs> but it's, it's, it's probably worth it at some point because of how influential it is, right? But um, from my understanding from a, some work that I was doing on the more the fourth century um, and looking at Augustine um, and the some of the ways that I heard people interpreting the city of God was more something like um, you have the city of God at least partially in time in the church in that the people in the church are people in time and acting out eternity at once right that's uh, partially like the mystery of the incarnation that Christ is God in time right so he is both of that eternal divine essence as well as a temporal human essence that's the doctrine that's the idea um and that the church is a similar kind of institution that's in both of those levels at once and sort of it's sitting there it's not it that doesn't mean that it's violently infecting everything in in this world but that its presence does transform the world to the extent that things graft themselves onto that church body and that um, you can think of when he was talking about monastics, that the monastics are people that are most outwardly and most forwardly and most obviously living that eternal life on earth. And that the that sort of they act as an example for the rest of the church, though the rest of the church is not to be expected or required by any means to do something like that. And you can see that in the Paul's letters as well, where he says something like that, like, oh, well, you couldn't live a celibate life or you could not. It's a good thing to do, but it's not something that's required or it's not like, the, you know, something like that. So the, I think, I, the, he, so he might just not have the right interpretation of Augustine. I don't know. Well, I don't know. I, I, we, we, yeah. Uh, but, he, yeah. but he's claiming that at least whether or not those things always exist at different interpretations, that in the papal revolution, the idea that the church is, has, has a role in reforming and judging the temporal world based on divine, the divine law or whatever it is, uh, becomes in some way dominant and, and takes charge through the papal party 
and through the supremacy of the papacy, right? I, th I think you can even see that in Eastern versus Western churches today, even though the Eastern church obviously does have a sense of mission and a sense of caring for others and being an agent of, of good in the world. It does still have the sense of we're here, you come to us, you know, like we're here, we're, you know, the true church, but you come to us. Whereas the West even today has more of a sense of, Hey, it's our job to go out. You, you get it. And especially with the Protestant reformation, like the wheels totally come off on that. And Protestantism is much more um, um, excitedly evangelistic. And in response, the Catholic Church becomes just as excitedly evangelistic around the world, too, with the Jesuit missionaries and such, right? So, you're, yeah. yeah. You're, you're interested in the monastic elements, right? Uh, that, yeah. I wonder if part of the story is the success of the Cluniac reforms. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't know too much about them until I was reading here, and I there's a there's another book coming out, but this sometime this summer, uh, specifically on that, which I'll be um, getting and, and reading. And specifically that 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 Clooney was able to the the monastery at Clooney, I guess it has three characteristics that stand out to me. One, uh, it was able locally to resist uh, control by the secular. It mm -hmm. was able to establish itself. Uh, avoid the simony, people buying offices, marrying the church. So they were able to keep this kind of strict religious uh, ex 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 exceptionalism. Yeah. Two, it took over a hierarchical role for lots of Cluniac, uh, like a hierarchy of monasteries that they that they were able to do this as an administrative, cent you know, centrally controlled system. And that's a model for the Pope. But then three, they have a, a through their influence, they are able to push the ball forward on the peace movement, right? The peace and truth of God, mm -hmm. holidays, times when people aren't going to aren't shouldn't fight classes of people who whom you're not supposed to be violent against. Mm -hmm. That explanation, um, maybe that gives people a sense that, you know, if we did this more extensively, maybe we could have more of this influence. Maybe you know, peace is this godly quality, right? Blessed are the peacemakers. We can we can do more of that. So maybe that's a part of the story of why the secular is no longer the dirty world to be put aside, but yeah, the dirty world. But I mean, well, <laughs> when when the Pope, when after the revolution, the first thing that the Pope does is not this big peace movement, but the Crusades. So it's 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 can it's used for different kinds of things. But yeah, that's totally right. That 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 I think the the pattern that I'm going to be wanting to research more and and learning its influence. I'm going to be focusing on England for the most part in my actual research. But um, the, the pattern that you sort of see is the, the Cluniacs are the second real major monastic society or rule. The, the Benedictines are really the first really comprehensive one. There's the Desert Fathers, which the, the, the Eastern, the earlier Eastern traditions are more scattered, but there's the Benedictine rule, which is very influential across the West, but that's late 500s. That's kind of what survives through the, the Dark Ages, the pre-Carolingian times. And then the Cluniacs are this, so you, what you see is you see these a new monastic orders formed. There's this huge explosion in population and fervor for that group, and it has some sort of impact and it solidifies some way of life. But over time, it gets slightly less popular. It doesn't grow as fast, and it slows down and slows down. But then at basically every 70 years or so until the end of the Middle Ages, you have another boom in a certain monastic order. So afterwards, you have the, um, well, the Augustinian canons grow at some point, and then um, you have the Cistercian order, and you and have- That, the, that yeah. represents people trying to escape the pollution of contact with the world, right? It's because- it's because monastic orders become successful mm -hmm. that kills them. And then someone's like, you know what, we need to start. Yes. Again. Yes. It's, it's, it's that, oh, we now have lands. We now have yeah. the ear of, of the of other people. We can influence. Uh oh, we can be influenced. People want to be part of us. People want to give land or, or other wealth yeah. to us. Oh, you know, we can do good things by keeping, oh, just a little bit of that or a little bit of this or, right. And then mm -hmm. people are like, okay, we've gone way too far. Let's have another yeah around so it's there's the kind of a cycle of contact yeah. with the world success breeds contact corruption separation success yeah. contact corruption the, and and the, there but there is also a sense that that in the west 
the what's unique about the uh, monastic orders is that they're more directly papally controlled. This is something I don't understand yet about how it actually developed financially and legally, but that I want to investigate more where the bishops, even though there was this sort of negotiation in the Concordate of Worms, there's a book that recently came out called The Invention of Power by Bueno de Mesquita, if you're familiar with him. He's, um, he's mostly known as a political scientist, and he's known for building sort of these game theory models of political coalition building, but he wrote this book on the Concordate of Worms and sort of a game theory model of the Concordate of Worms. And his conclusion is that it actually gave more power to the secular lords, he thinks, because, um, because the way that it was set up was this is the text of the, basically based on the short text of the Concordate of Worms, the Pope proposes a candidate and then the King approves or refuses the candidate. And then, um, and then if the King refuses the candidate, the Pope has to find a new candidate. And in that interim period, the King can take the incomes of the diocese, basically. So the prediction of the model is and basically until the Pope provides a candidate that the King accepts. So the, the King has an incentive to reject candidates more often in higher income dioceses because it's he's getting more um, rents essentially from those dioceses. And now I don't know, he basically, Mesquita basically assumes that that model is how it worked across the board. I don't think that's actually true, especially not in England. But but the idea is, okay, well, if the bishops, this is my general model that I'm building, if bishops as a part of the church are easier for secular authorities to sort of capture, monastics are harder, almost by the nature of, how, of what they do. But you need someone like a bishop that's doing diplomacy, that's managing land, that's managing finance. So there's going to be someone that is capturable by the secular authority, but there's also going to be so that that's why you need someone like monastics. And I think that the that was the the papal direct control over monastic orders was a way for him to sneak in the the, the back door around the episcopal structures. And uh, oh, and it's you of course have to mention the Knights Templar who were the Pope's agents for the most part across Europe and in the Crusades too. So the group these monastic orders. They're, they're both further away from authority, but also closer to that papal authority, especially in the West, it was that way. Whereas in the East, the monks were really the fringes uh, away, much further away from the central authorities or the central church authorities and the, the central secular authorities because they never developed into orders. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a complicated history. And I, I really, I, I'm looking forward to investigating that. <laughs> I, I can we I think we should probably debrief in about 10 minutes or so. Sure, sure. But I have I have one last question about um, his discussion of metaphor. Oh, true. Yeah, he starts it in the preface and it, and it ends at the end of second the second chapter. Uh, he says in the preface that uh, one way to understand the crisis and the need is in terms of let's see. This is on page V of the preface. Uh, he says that we're at the end of an era um, is known by intuition. And he put, I think this is a, a, a poem by Archibald McLeish called The Metaphor. He says, when old images have lost their meaning, that's when an era has come to an end. And uh, he brings up this idea of metaphor um, religious and legal metaphors. And then at the very end of chapter two, he brings up the idea of cathedral. Um, he talks about the, on page 118, the most dramatic illustration of the new sense of time that is historical time rather than the old sense of secular uh, was seen in the new Gothic architecture, the great cathedrals expressed in their soaring spires and flying buttresses and elongated vaulted arches, a dynamic spirit of movement upward, a sense of achieving, of incarnation of ultimate values. Mm. It's also noteworthy that they were often planned to be built over generations and centuries. And earlier in the book, he talks about how they had um, budgets for a thousand or years or more. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you see as the meaning of a cathedral uh, as, the met as, as the metaphor. If, if the cathedral is the image whose meaning is lost, in what way is the cathedral the metaphor for the kind of law that, uh, or kind of understanding of law that 
he thinks we're losing or have lost and need to reinvigorate. I know, I've heard over the years people saying things like, oh, well, Christianity introduced a progressive sense of time into the world. And in the ancient world, they thought time was circular. And I never totally got what that meant because it seemed like if you went to a ancient Greek farmer, for example, and you asked them how much, how many crops they collected last year and then next year. And if they kept a ledger, it would be like years in one column and like wheat collected in the next column and it would go on forever. It wouldn't like, it wouldn't just like start wrapping the paper up and turn it into a circle or something. They, they, they have a linear sense of time, right? But, uh, which were like, so I was like, what exactly was invented? But I think that maybe our discussion is commenting on that a little bit um, in the sense that time means something else because it's where something else is happening. So if time is where things are being integrated into higher orders through this successive conflict and resolution and conflict and resolution, and that's, so it's where we're climbing up, like climbing up a, a steeple is different than, um, it's different than, oh, well, this is a place where our society just keeps on keeping on or and maybe degenerates right so then when when you have that christian vision you see the secular or the, the previous vision as degenerate but when you have this christian vision you say oh well i can now understand time as a place where we can build and grow and progress and build a cathedral that lasts forever but we can see over the successive generations each part of it growing up and up and up and i guess and if the the gothic architecture and that style of cathedral architecture changes at this time that makes total sense that if this is when the idea of the real clear idea of progress here on earth breaks out of the gates of christianity and into the rest of the world through the papal revolution that would contrast it well with the eastern architecture which the idea the idea in the architecture of an eastern church is that you have a um, a square sort of or rectangular sort of body of the church and then a dome on top right representing the two natures of Christ his his earthly temporal human nature and then his heavenly eternal divine nature and so it's literally it's literally a squaring of the circle so it's basically saying yeah we know the incarnation is impossible it's and they use the canonical example of an impossibility a square circle get over it you know and then and and so that, that's a ceiling more of, in the dome. The dome is a ceiling. Yes, right? yes, like, that's, that's true. The cap. That's the, the top, and there it is. Yes. And somehow yep. these two things are reconciled. Whereas in a cathedral, there's a reaching, right? In fact, height was all at the next cathedral. You always wanted to be taller. You're like yeah. reaching up to something beyond that's like it's pointing from earth to heaven, right? And and trying to reach up higher and higher. Mm -hmm. But the the other biblical image of a tower is the Tower of Babel, too, which is which is some other spirit trying to get up to heaven and failing because it it actually doesn't it actually isn't that and that well this is caleb and i's bias probably is that the roman church maybe thought that it could be the institution that reached from heaven all the way up and then it collapsed into all the different protestant languages like the tower of babel somehow but yeah and then but then it, okay but then is if christianity is about developing heaven developing heavenly principles on earth don't you need to, to 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 try and do that and so is the eastern model missing something or not trying what it's supposed to be doing i don't know well, i'm going to pivot a little bit but um stay on the, the topic and i do think that the, the cathedral is is a really interesting symbol of what is trying to be done in the west but I think it's also useful not to just um, understand it statically as, as we see it now, but also dynamically of how it be lived of people coming from outside the city and, and entering into the cathedral and then going back out and then coming back in. And it's almost like the church is breathing people in and out the city. Um, and people are constantly being pulled up into spiritual things and then being taking what they have back out into the world. And we could almost apply the symbolism of how they're they're used today in the modern west as something to stand in contrast to how they were used where nowadays a lot of them have become museums where they're not really they're used somewhat but really they're they're places that tourists come to visit and they look at it and observe it but they don't 
live within this tradition that it's um, it was supposed to be embedded within. And we can see that same thing happening with the Western legal tradition where we look back at how people lived previously and we observe it, but we don't see ourselves as being in continuity with that in the same way that they would have been um, in continuity with the tradition that they're coming from. And so it, the cathedral, I think, is an apt symbol of, of what was happening, but I think also the interaction of people with the cathedral is still a good image for how um, people interact with the Western legal tradition. Well, and what you're saying sounds like the relationship between with that poem. I didn't read it out loud, but talking about how when imagers are seen, but they no longer mean, right? You're saying people see cathedrals today, but they don't actually necessarily conceive of them as the place where the human and the divine are meeting. It's not an embodiment of divine values. Um, and the thing he, he stresses a lot is that the cathedral was conceived of as an ongoing project to which many people would contribute over from generation to generation. It was something you inherited, but you didn't stop there. You actually built on what was coming before and you were reaching to the future, to people who weren't here yet. And you sometimes have to rework what, had, what the plan was before, right? You re-engineer stuff. It's like, oh, we, we can change things at this point. We're building on what was there, or maybe it wasn't gonna work entirely, or maybe there's a new, a new need now. Um, and because we have these, you have these museum pieces, they're seen, but they no longer mean. Like, you don't, people don't think about the cathedral as a thing you're building, right? You don't, like, if you went to a cathedral in, in, in uh, the high many, you know, middle ages, you'd be like, wow. And you'd also be like, this is going to be here. This is going to be built. This is for the future. It's from the past. It's here and it's for the future. Um, what's, what's and with, the, yeah, with just, and, but I mean, we were always, trying to generate new images that mean things, right? And so after basically, after the, the Protestant Reformation, you have slowly a development of new forms of art or new, like, um, you know, uh, classical music becomes very big and, and, and that is seen as like a source of revealing things to people, whereas previously a cathedral might have, right? Like uh, Wagner talks about that, like art being that key into the, the world and I think, and Nietzsche took on from him um, somewhat. And then, and then if, you, if you just think about every, in, the, in America in the past 70 years, every 15 years has like a new generation of music that motivates their whole spirit, right? So like the, the 60s were all motivated by a certain kind of music and that told them what it meant to be part of their movement and part of that revolution. And every, and, and people, people can listen to that and get something out of it. And, and people like, like someone that's more on the left today might listen to music from the sixties. Like this is our tradition. This tells us where we come from, but, but it's not, but they still, there's still as an update every few years of telling us, particularly in this context, where how are we updating meaning something new? And so well, and there are, that, there are substitutes for it that people like are using. He's, maybe he's doing that. I don't think he's saying, Hey, let's look at the cathedrals. Right. He, but I think he's trying to give us a metaphor. And at the end of the preface, he says, he says to present the history of law in the West as a metaphor of our age, which is, he goes on to say some other things about, it, but it's, he's suggesting that's what his attempt is. And the last paragraph of the second uh, chapter, as he's talking about these monuments or symbols of this change, first is the cathedral. And then the, the last paragraph is less dramatic, but more significant as a symbol of the new belief in progress towards salvation were the great legal monuments that were built in the same period. In contrast, not only to the earlier Western folk law, but to Roman law, both before and after Justinian, law in the West in the late 11th and 12th centuries and thereafter was conceived as an organically developing system, an ongoing and, an ongoing and growing body of principles and procedures constructed like the cathedrals over generations and centuries. And he's, I, think he, I think he's interested, he, I, I think he wants law of that nature to be a metaphor for us, is my, is my understanding of what he's kind of suggest, suggesting. Like, can we see ourselves as contributing to this legal monument that has in, it started back then, it exists now, does it have a future? And how do we have to integrate with what came before to know what it is now and where it can go? Shall we, shall we spend some time saying uh, just, 
how we thought the conversation went, put aside the content of the conversation, just talk about the process of when, when, did, you, when did you feel you were most engaged and when the conversation was most um, helpful in advancing our understanding and when did you feel we could have been better? And so what were we doing that was leading to that engagement and what could we do to lead to more of that? What could we change next time to have more of that in the future? I thought, it, I thought it went pretty well. I was pretty engaged throughout. I didn't notice any uh, dead spots or anything like that or anything like that. But um, um, I did have a thought maybe next time we could do something like each one for each section, each one of, because he does have subheaders too within it. Maybe each one of us um, picks a paragraph or something that we can copy out of that section. Not that we all need to share the paragraph, but that um, that it's a way of like, Oh, this is what I, the main thing I took out of this section or like, like similar to like the, the passages that you had sort of selected out or had reminded yourself of, we could each keep a log of that. I think that would be helpful. It would be helpful for me at least because both Caleb and I are using a PDF, I think of the book. So it's harder so to in, sort in through preparation, it. Each person yeah. can identify what is the central thing that's of interest to them in the second the section yeah. or chapter. And what, what things would, do you see that we were doing that you were like, that's awesome. And we should do more of that. I like that we pretty... kept the chapters one and two together because um, it felt like we weren't just like walking through the book and just doing exactly what he was doing, but we were more engaging with the spirit of what he was trying to get across. So instead of like just working chronologically through the book and and kind of commenting on it, we're, we're dealing with some of the bigger ideas. And so I think that by not necessarily breaking it down um, chapter by chapter, we'll have a chance to hit some of the more overarching themes instead of getting stuck in the weeds on some things. Awesome. Yeah, I agree. I'm trying to think um, next time, what chapters did we intend to cover? Let's, let's talk about that okay. in a minute. Let's go, let's have okay. each of us say one, what, one thing we thought was really contributing and one thing we could change to have it be better next time. And Mar Marcus, you want to say anything you think we could? uh was going well um oh i i just thought um we yeah we, i think just naturally since we're inter all interested in a similar way of looking at the topic we were able to go back and forth well and we were responding to each other's points properly too it wasn't some sometimes even in the in the like the liberty style kind of thing somebody who has a long point can put up a long point say it and then no one's everyone's like either yeah or i'm not interested and it kind of moves on from that but we were going we were making sure to engage say i agree i disagree which is an advantage of a small group i think mm -hmm. definitely yeah so i thought we um, did I, th I thought we did good at that i thought so too and i uh, my something i think could be improved is, and i don't know how to do it i'm really auditorily not very smart like it's very hard for me to listen and mm -hmm. mark some of your comments were quite long like I, I feel like if you could say if you I actually really enjoyed what you were talking about but sometimes I was it, sometimes when you would go from one comment to another related to another then I kind of felt I was trying to it was hard for me to keep, keep it mm -hmm. integrated with the conversation so if you would pay attention to when like if this is the content of the conversation this is the thing related I just want you to be aware if you're going to go to a second and third connection that you're making because it's harder for me yeah. to follow I don't know if other I don't know if Caleb, you're feeling the same way, but that's that just that would be one thing to improve. Just like try to keep things shorter and de more directly connected to uh, what we're doing so that I know what to do with it. Because sometimes at some point mm -hmm. I got like three things and it was a lot of information, very hard to integrate. And then I was like, OK, well, let's move and let's go back to a new thing rather than how do I flow that with what was before? Does that make sense? Yeah, I have I have when I write when I. I'm talking in any kind of semi-formal thing like this, I always have to write down like points, like what I'm going to say. And if I don't do that, I just go off. Well, I, or else, actually, uh, otherwise, I enjoy yeah. watching it as like a force of nature. And, and, and actually I was yeah. thinking as at a couple of times, I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to have to go back and watch this video because I'm interested and I'm not catching it all. Um, and in terms of like creating flow in the conversation, just like one step removed from what we're doing so that I know what to do with it. You know, it's, it'll just be easier if that makes sense and mm -hmm. okay uh, yeah i will watch for that awesome and i also just enjoyed the spirit of the conversation i, I enjoyed that people were were interested and uh 
and that it was like, it was a living thing. I really enjoyed that. And there were two comments that Caleb made. It was like very, it like really, really helped me understand what was going on for my own question. So I really appreciate that. Is there anything you think we could do to uh, improve, Caleb? Um, so I agree with you that there were moments where I lost the thread of the conversation. And so maybe tightening up comments would help. Um, and then I also, I came in not exactly sure where we we're going. And so it might be helpful if we like have a Google doc and we say like one or two questions that we're gonna come in with. And so that at least gives us a frame of mind of what we're, we're approaching this with. I'm sorry, you froze for about 10 seconds. Can you say that again? Okay, um, everything over again, or? You said I came in with, and then I didn't hear anything else. Okay, um, not knowing uh, what to expect really, um, where our emphasis was gonna be. And so it might be helpful to have one or two like key questions that each of us has in a Google doc. And so we can review that ahead of time and kind of get a, a sense of what we should be reading for, or looking for in the text to start mm -hmm. to have an uh, idea of where to pull stuff from to have a more productive conversation. Okay. Uh, do you want to make a Google Doc and share questions that are coming up? And I and, and uh, I can add to it and you guys can add to it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll send that in the email chain. Yeah. Awesome. And I'm really appreciative to both of you for setting things up and getting things moving and Inviting people. Yeah. I, wish, I hope other people come as well. Yeah, I was I was gonna say I hope that uh, Jacob comes because the next one of the next chapters is I think it's gonna be more on England. And he's he's his focus is the English monarchy and how it developed over time. But Jake, we're building a cathedral here. You can't just like show up and use it. You gotta yeah. contribute, you gotta build. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um yeah. so what would you like to do for next time in terms of reading? Um, I think so it we had originally planned four parts and we were we shifted we chapter three from um, this week to, to next week. I think if I'm looking at the table of contents, um, chapter three to the end of chapter seven would be um, about 150 pages. This time we did about 120 pages. So I think that because because it's in two parts, the first part seems to be more historical, the second part seems to be more focusing on different aspects of law, which will be interesting. Oh, there's a whole section on mercantile law. That'll be interesting. But um, yeah, so I, I, we, we could try to do uh, to the end of part one, and that's a, about 150 pages. Um, that sounds fine to me. I can make yeah, it it's universities, theology, canon law, more on canon law, and then Beckett versus Henry II. Good. We can shoot for that and then see if that's making sense. Yeah, I found I definitely found the first two chapters were easier to read. So I hope that's true of, of the succeeding chapters. Uh, mm -hmm. Easier to read than the introduction, which I was like lots of new ideas and very intricate. And I was like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I loved it. I was like, this is you know powerful stuff. But the conversation really did help me understand what was going on more. You know, and these next chapters, chapters, they seem a little bit more isolated in terms of their topic. So he'll, I think it feels like it's much more likely to help focus in, on particular issues. And then we'll see how the ideas in the first two chapters play out in there. I, I hope so. And maybe one of the things thematically I'd be interested to keep watching for is he says he, his, his motive in writing the book is to find within the experience of the tradition, resources to ext extricate ourselves from the impending doom, <laughs> right? So it's like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just curious, like what are those resources? How do, we, how do we get to this newer sense of what he's looking for rather than just the details? Mm -hmm. so like, what's the, what are the resources? He's not saying he knows what they are. He's like, describes himself as a drowning man, looking at, the, looking at his life, like how do I get myself out of here? But if that's something we can find, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Good. Should we just talk two more minutes after we end the recording? Sure, let's do it. But anyway, this was great. And um, we will hopefully see the rest of the watchers later. And I'll stop it right here. Yeah.